was that you felt a hunger, a need to be among people who loved one another. He was not naive. He knew what these people were in ordinary life, the tensions, the difficulties, their fears. But there, in the church, something happened to them. And the church was a place where it happened. He did not immediately turn his mind and heart towards the knowledge of God or belief in him. He turned him towards the people who were there and he tried to become one of them, to share their mutual attitude. He felt relaxed. He felt at peace. He felt it was a place where nothing but mutual good will existed. And that was for him the beginning of the discovery of him who gave this peace. My peace I give unto you. Not as the world gives, do I give. A second example of the same type occurred here. A number of years ago, a man came to this church loaded with a parcel for one of the parishioners. He was an unbeliever, rather impatient, almost aggressive, and he had made calculations so as to arrive here when the service was over because he wanted to deliver his parcel but he did not want to have anything to do with what was going on inside these walls. But Providence has thought of it differently. He arrived before the the evening service was over. Impatiently, he settled at the back of the church with his parcel. And then something happened to him. Because when he had delivered his parcel, and everyone had gone, and I was going around to check everything, I found him sitting at the back. And I mildly suggested that it was time for him to go home. And he said, no, you must explain something to me. What is happening here? Is it, what is it that has affected me, that has impressed me? I'm an unbeliever. I'm certain that God doesn't exist. And yet, something was happening. Is it the effect of the candlelight? Is it the mournful singing of your choir? Is it the quiet that is here, which one doesn't meet in the street? What was it? I shrugged my shoulders and said, I would say it's God's presence. But if you believe that there is no God, you must look for another explanation. He said, yes, I want to come here sometime when no one is in this church, so that the collective hysteria of your people doesn't affect me. And if I come, I want you to make yourself scarce, because I don't want to be influenced by your presence 
I said, yes, come again. He came several times, sat for a long while, and one day he said to me, you know, when there is no one, when you have made yourself scarce, there is still something in this church which I have not met or found anywhere. Supposing it is God who lives here and that in his presence people feel well, peaceful, comfortable, warm to one another. What does it really matter? You have provided him with lodgings. He lives here comfortably. He makes yourself welcome when you come. And what then? I said, I don't know. Come again and find out. And he came again. And one day he said to me, you know, I have noticed something. When key people come to the church, there is worry in their faces. There is tension in their behavior. When they go, they are still. One can have a feeling that they are at peace with themselves and with one another. And then there is another thing which I simply can't understand. People who come in the morning service <clears throat> to the steps that are now behind me and receive something from a cup with a spoon, they come with one face. When they turn around, their faces are absolutely changed. There is light in them. There is light in their eyes. So that your God must be not only a host in this building. He's an active God. He does something about people. And something which I wish someone could do for me. I said, yes, how do you want to proceed? I want you to talk to me and to explain things to me which I don't understand or know. And for a while he came regularly, then he came to services and he stood still and quiet. And one day he said, I know now that God your God is an active God who transforms people. I need being transformed. Could I be baptized? Here was another experience in which a congregation, which you know perfectly well, made of very ordinary people, none of us, is a saint. We all have our tensions, our problems. But collectively and in the presence and under the power of God, something was happening. This man became a believer because he had discovered something here he had not met anywhere else. And when I say anywhere else, I don't mean in any other church. I mean simply outside the church. In the first case, what the man in Russia discovered is that a community of people who have discovered God in their own time, when they gathered together, they shook off, as it were, like dust. 
all that was superficial, all that was small, all that was ugly in them, and stood with all the beauty there was in them, some with little of it, some with more of it. But the dust was left outside. In the second case, the provocation, if I may use this word, was even stronger. And this man discovered the reality of God through what he was doing to people. Now, this raises several problems, and I will mention only one for the moment. It's the fact that what St. Paul said, we ca carry holy things in earthen vessels, in broken vessels, in unworthy vessels happens to be so true. These men, these two men discovered that we, this congregation of ours, which is made of most ordinary people, imperfect, sinful, still had discovered a dimension which they did not know, a dimension of divinity, of eternity, of holiness, of love, and that they carried something of it out of the church when they went into the world. Now, I have asked myself a question which I will present to you rather than expound, because I don't think I have a real answer to everything I'm saying. What happened to the disciples who met Christ? What happened to the crowds that were around him and around them. The first question I have asked myself is this. Christ was God coming to the world in the flesh. From the beginning of his life on earth, as a newborn child, as a boy, as a youth, he was the Son of God incarnate. And he was surrounded by people who did not know that, but to know him. How could they see him? I know that there are a number of what one calls the Gospels of the childhood of Christ, in which fantasy plays a great role that do not correspond to history or perhaps even to reality. But the thing that strikes me is that he was a boy like other boys, a child like other children. He had a relationship with his mother and with Joseph. How did people perceive him then? Certainly not like an image of piousness and saintliness which the Gospels of the childhood try to convey. He must have been a normal, healthy, sane little boy. And yet, 
those of his disciples who knew him as a child, who lived in the villages nearby, in Capernaum. and other places around must have met him and seen in him a normal child and yet something more, something else. Perhaps a purity, a perceptiveness, a capability of loving, a capability of giving himself to others and for others, which was not their own experience in themselves. From the very beginning, they must have been in the presence of God incarnate, revealing himself step by step at the various moments of a child's growth and development. This is something which we could not really comprehend or imagine. But it's something real. God was present in him in the fullness of his divinity and he was a normal child of his age. He may have had a perceptiveness, an understanding, which others didn't possess to a degree which was beyond them, certainly. You remember the story of Jesus being left behind by his parents and discovered by them in the temple of Jerusalem when he was sitting with the teachers and the elders who were asking questions and listening with amazement to his replies. He had a knowledge of God, a knowledge of things divine, which he expressed probably in words of his age, or rather perhaps in ageless words of truth and of beauty. And then some of those who had known him in Nazareth and in the pilgrimages met him later. Nathanael was one. Jesus was speaking to others and then, turning towards Nathanael, he said that here is a Jew without fault, as it were. I can't find the word. And Nathanael said, how do you know me? They had never met. And Jesus said, when you were under the tree, I saw you. What does it mean? It may mean, of course, that Nathanael was perhaps kneeling and praying, and Jesus noticed that. But Jesus must have met more than one man or woman or child praying. And the response of Nathanael was far beyond the simple observation of a man in prayer. He said, my Lord and my God. 
and in the comments of early days, we are told that that means that he was then praying to God and the words of Christ made him see that Jesus was the God to whom he was praying without knowing him. This was one meeting that made him into an absolute believer in the Godhead of the incarnate Son. Then we meet other of his disciples, ordinary, normal people, not trained to be something in religion, fishermen, Christ saw them, they had known one another in Galilee, as children, as youth, as young men, and he sees them by the sea, and he turns to them and says, follow me, and they leave everything and follow him. What is this act of complete trust? What did they perceive in him that they could abandon everything they had and were doing to follow in his footsteps, to accompany him on a journey of which they knew nothing? And one cannot say that from the first moment the disciples were possessed of a faith comparable to that of the saints whose lives we read. Because time and again there were problems. The humanity still unredeemed, as it were, played a decisive role. When later Jesus was standing before judgment, Peter renounced him three times for fear of being recognized of his disciple. And then something happened. He had walked out of the courtyard, having betrayed his friend for the third time. And he looked around, and Christ turned his head and looked at him. Their eyes met, and Peter dissolved in tears. And then their humanity prevailed more than once. By the cross there was only John, the youngest of them all, who was, if I may put it that way, nothing but a loving heart and the mother of God. And the mother of God was there knowing who her son was, knowing that she had borne him unto death knowing that now she could not say a word of prayer to save him from 
dying for the salvation of the world. She was bringing him as a living offering without a word to gainsay. That was an act of faith. She trusted God's promise. But God had not promised Christ's resurrection. He had only promised that he was a savior of the world. And not in such clear terms. And by the cross, we find the mother who is offering her son unto death because he was born for that hour. And a young disciple whose love was so simple and entire that he stood by, sharing the horror, the pain of the mother, and the dying of his beloved master. Faith was then faithfulness. It was not yet what we call our religious faith. He was faithful to his friend. And as his friend was his God, his faithfulness to his friend was beyond earthly faithfulness. But where were the other disciples? Judas had hanged himself. He had betrayed him and he had not waited for his own redemption salvation. But the other disciples were gathered together in fear. Peter was one of them, feeling that he was a traitor and the other ones that they had fled in Cardis and Thomas wasn't there at all and Christ appeared in their midst and they were full of joy because Christ was alive that death somehow had not conquered. And Christ gave them evidence that he was risen from the dead and not a ghost. And the joy was such. And then Thomas came. What did he see? He saw ten of his companions rejoicing in the resurrection of Christ. But somehow unchanged. Instead of fear, there was joy. But they were the same men. He could not believe that had they met the risen Christ, they would be the very same men from whom he had parted on his journey. And he said, unless I test his resurrection, I will not believe. And when Christ appeared, 
He was made to test it, but he didn't. Seeing Christ, he knew that he was a risen one. He became a believer in the resurrection. But it is only later, when the Holy Spirit came upon his disciples, that they changed in such a way that everyone could recognize in them messengers of God. For better or worse, the ones saw them as messengers of truth and of life and followed them. Others saw them as preachers of a false god, of an untruth, and killed them and their disciples also. But the experience was such that there was absolute certainty. When we think of ourselves, where do we stand? Each of us. On the one hand, we are that congregation in which an unbelieving man discovered something of the Divine Presence. Each of us is a broken earthen vessel, and yet there is a drop of life eternal given us by God, and when we meet here, we shed by the door, as it were, all that is intentionally unworthy of God. I say intentionally because so much in each of us is unworthy of Him. But the intention is, the desire is, the longing is, the determination indeed is to be worthy, to be worthy in our faithfulness of the God who is faithful. But each of us must ask himself, who is he? Where does he stand in this line? On the one hand, each of us has touched the hem of Christ's garment, has seen him pass, has heard him speak, has been moved by something, and has become a follower. I don't say disciple, because a disciple is more than a follower. There were crowds following Christ in search, in search within themselves and within others of life eternal. And each of us also has discovered a certainty that yes, God exists. That, uh, yes, Christ is the Son of God. That, yes, the Holy Spirit comes upon us and teaches us. But there is a dimension which God claims from us, or rather which is essential for us to grow into 
another dimension of fullness. It's not only certainty, it's faithfulness. If what we know of Christ is true, if his teaching is the truth, then how can we be alien day in, day out to his teaching? This is the question to which I want to come next time by looking at our lives on the one hand and the prayers which we use on the other hand. I hope that this talk of mine has not been too confused. Try to think it out and bring it to clarity because it is important and I'm groping for understanding do the same. I will end my talk now and we will have a short period of silence as usual after which I will ask you contrary to our habits not to come up for a blessing because I have got a bad flu and I claim it for myself. I want to keep it for myself and not to share it with anyone else.